This is a precision turbo compressor housing owned by my friend and fellow YouTuber, Reckless Regal. Now, legend has it that the turbo decided to take a swan dive off the bench and onto the floor where a bolt attempted to intercept it, but only made it worse. Now, my challenge is to fix the damaged area for less than the cost of a new $230 housing. Do you think this result made it under budget? Let's find out. Now, just like any other job, we have to get the material ready to be welded by bringing it to a brightened state. In this case, the ceramic coating would definitely make the job harder if I left it on. So the easiest way to remove it is with a little whirly wire wheel on the end of my drill. Now, you could use a wire wheel on a grinder or maybe some mild sandpaper if that's all you have. Now, just make sure whatever it is that it isn't too aggressive where it starts beating up the metal. We just want to remove the coating. After thoroughly inspecting the damage, I came to the conclusion that it would be best to just cut away the damaged section and refill it with weld. To identify where the damage was, I simply took a 4-inch tube, which is the same size as the inlet, and I lined it up right on top of the inlet. Any section that bulged out or didn't line up with that radius was marked out. This is a pretty clever trick if you just need a quick glance. Cutting the damaged section out was a job for my cutoff wheel. Now there are several other tools you can use for this instead, but I really like showing the simple tools in action when I do these repairs. Cleanup is done with a file because I do not want to damage or grind away the metal around the damaged area as it will disrupt the contour itself. The file allows me just to touch on those areas that I need a good cleanup on. With everything cleaned up and ready, we can now move on to machine settings. I'm using my Fronius Magic Wave 230i for this repair because it offers a fantastic feature that will really help on this thin cast. The feature is the ability to change the waveforms independently on both positive and negative. So for this repair, I'm going to use a triangle negative wave and a rectangle or square positive wave. Wait, what? What sort of advantage does this setup offer? Well, to answer that, we have to look into how cast aluminum is constructed. Now, cast aluminum has a consistency to it, which is usually only best described as a metallic sponge. There are several pores and residual materials from the casting process that are trapped inside of that metal. When we go to weld the cast, all of the pores and residual particles will surface in the weld, which creates a rather annoying byproduct, which we often refer to as junk. Part of the welding process with cast aluminum is to push the impurities out by running the torch over the cast to remelt it with a nice new layer of solid aluminum. It's kind of like recasting. I'll show you this in a minute, what I mean. Now, the positive side of the AC wave is responsible for cleaning the material and pushing the junk out. Now, quite often you see welders, myself included, welding cast with a balance setting closer to 50% positive, which means it pushes more impurities out during that cycle. The negative side of the waveform is responsible for penetration. For most cast material, a square wave will do just fine, but for this repair, the location is very thin, which means I would have to run with less amps in order to make it fill. The problem with the less amps is I would end up losing some of the cleaning side of the positive if I didn't have as much power to clean it. Now, a square waveform is a powerful one. If the height of this graph represents the amplitude or how much power the machine is giving you, the distance across is the amount of time the machine is doing work for that cycle. With a square waveform, the amount of work is 100% of the time. Compare that to a triangle wave, on the other hand, it only pings the peak output for a brief moment, which means it's doing less work. Less work on the negative side means that my profile will sit a little bit more on top of the surface, which is great because the piece is so thin. It's kind of like welding with less amps. But having a square wave on the positive side means that I don't lose any of that cleaning action I need to successfully weld this very dirty metal. So with that very winded explanation out of the way, let's weld this sucker shut. The first pass is meant to melt the metal back down to a more solid layer without the impurities. This often takes just a few runs over the top until you don't see any more bubbles coming up to the surface. The result looks something like this when you're finished. The next pass is to build up the corners a little bit with material. It's better to have more material than less material built up because we want to try to avoid going back over it again and again. Oh, and as a side note, I decided to shoot these arc shots with my less expensive camera, so just to see if it was going to work, but sadly everything on this repair can only be done in one take, so my apologies, these last couple arc shots aren't as clear as they typically are on here. But either way, this is about what it looks like after the first build-up pass. 
Now here is the crispy arc shot from the very expensive camera. Now the goal in this build up here is to get everything done in one single session. As in, I don't want to build it up, grind it, and then go back over it again. I want to knock it all out in one shot. In order to do that, I need to throw down a little bit heavier of a bead and push a little bit more metal into it so it kind of bulges out much thicker than this piece actually is. Now this ensures that I'll be able to grind and smooth it all back down nicely without having to go back over it and build it up again. If you don't put enough metal back on, it's just not going to look right. Now all of this is just taking my time and being careful to not overheat the part. Now I have to work fast, but I have to also work accurately, and I have to get this right, and my foot pedal is definitely playing a huge role on controlling the heat of this part. When I go in for a little bit of a dab, I'm using just a little bit more foot pedal, and if I'm coming out of it, letting it solidify, I'm letting off my foot pedal. You can see the change in brightness of this arc, and that's corresponding to where my foot is at. There is no locked-in position for this. It's not like a setting or anything else like that. It's all about seeing what's in front of you and working with it. Now with the welding complete, it's time to move on to the finishing work. I started by clamping the housing into a vise on the grinding table. My carbide burr tool was tasked with taking the bulk of the metal down first. Now this is a delicate process, and you should take your time. It's also worth noting that you don't want to take all the material down to the finished thickness or the finished blend with the very rough tools. That final contour shape is going to have to be done with finer tools, not something this rough. Now, under normal circumstances, I would show you what, exactly what I mean by that, but unfortunately, I ran into a little bit of a snag. The inside was basically shaped and final finished with a flat drum on my air grinder. The same tool is what I started shaping the outside profile with as well. Again, taking my time and letting that flat drum do all of the work. It's really all about that finesse and feel when it comes to this type of work. Something I can't really put into a video or teach you guys how to do. It just takes some experience. Now you're going to need a lot of experience and you're going to need to understand that finesse and feel, especially if you're going to attack it like I do by using my big old grinder here. The flat disc on my grinder is a very comfortable tool for me to use. It takes down a lot of metal in a short amount of time, which gives me a general shape to work with. Notice that I don't take it all the way down though, just enough because all I want is just that general shape. Next, I switched over to my file. Now, normally, I don't run the file back and forth like this to shape out my metal. I usually just go one direction, and mostly that's because the internet doesn't like it. But when you have very little space to work with and are trying not to hit surfaces that don't need to be filed, you tend to break the rules a little bit. I need the file in this case to finally define that contour as well as define the lip of this inlet. Once the general shape was made on all the surfaces, I went back over with the flap disc to very carefully blend and shape it. To face off this repair, I opted for a quick but kind of risky solution. I started by taping off the sections that I didn't want to get faced. Now, it's not like the strongest form of defense on this one, you gotta be really careful, but it actually helps to prevent quick little nicks and unwanted accidental scratches. The repair area left exposed will be faced with my disc sander. Now, I tried to get it as close to flat and level with the rest of the inlet face as possible so that if I need to take any more off of it, it will only be a tiny bit with a file or a flap drum. Finishing it off was just a matter of chasing out any little details or tiny imperfections that kind of bugged me, and I decided to get rid of the heavy file marks by brushing it over with a piece of emery cloth. The end result looks something like this. Now, if I had to go back and critique my work on this repair, I would definitely rather not see the pinholes in the couple of spots that we have here, and I would definitely like to have better definition on that lip in a couple of different spots. Kind of make it look like it wasn't really all that repaired. You'd have to look a lot closer than just, you know, close. But either way, this is how it stands. Now, the goal was to keep it under the price of a new housing, which was just over 200 bucks. The total repair time for me to get to this point is 72 minutes, which brings us to a grand total of $120.24 for this repair as it sits right now. Now, if I would have gone back and chased out some of those bubbles or those pits or maybe straightened out the lines a little bit more like I would have wanted to, I definitely would have gone over budget. So as it sits is as it's going out. I appreciate you guys watching. I'll catch you all in the next episode.